Good morning, everyone, and welcome to EG full paper session number nine. My name is Marcel Kampen, and I will guide you through this session titled Meshes and Subdivision. We have four paper presentations coming up, and yes, they will indeed involve quite some meshes and subdivision of meshes, promise. If you are watching this live, you have the unique opportunity to post questions about their work to the presenters. Just type your question here in the YouTube chat or the corresponding Discord channel at any time during the talk. No need to wait um, till the end. I will then take care of passing on your questions to the presenters right after each talk for a live discussion on that. But now let's get started right away with the first paper. It is titled Polygon Laplacian Made Simple. And the talk will be given by Astrid Bunge, the, this paper's first author. Take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Astrid Bunge, and today I will give a talk about our new paper, Polygon Laplacian Made Simple. Our paper deals with the new discretization of the Laplacian operator for arbitrary polygon meshes. The Laplacian plays a prominent role in geometric modeling and related fields and has various applications. It is, for example, involved in solving many PVEs and intimately related to the notion of curvature and signal frequencies. And concerning its discretization, it has been well investigated for triangle meshes, since they are the more or less standard surface representation. And all this attention over the years led to numerous definitions, with the classical cotangent Laplacian emerging as the de facto standard. On the other hand, polygon meshes have received far less attention. This is unfortunate as they are well used in many fields, for example by artists, since they fulfill properties triangles are simply not able to simulate. However, if triangles are so well investigated, the question arises why not to simply triangulate all the polygon meshes we are faced with and just deal with the consequences? Well, polygon meshes are commonly designed to align to certain surface features and capture symmetries of the shape. For example, quad meshes typically align with the principal curvature directions of a mesh. If we now introduce an arbitrary triangulation, it can break these properties and lead to noticeable artifacts. One could argue that an alternative approach would be to refine the polygon mesh by introducing a new vertex in the middle of each face. This would preserve the symmetry structure, but would also come at the cost of an increase in the finite element system dimension. Previous work tried to tackle the problem of a polygon Laplacian, for example, Jean et al. They built an operator explicitly for quad meshes by averaging over both triangulations of each quad. Alexa and Badetsky went even a step further because they constructed the current state of the art polygon Laplacian. They circumvented the problem that non planar polygons in 3D do not really bound a canonical surface patch by considering the projection of the polygon onto the plane that yields the largest projection area. However, their operator involves a parameter from now on called lambda without an obvious interpretation. We wanted to simplify this matter. Instead of inserting a new vertex and altering the mesh altogether, we introduce a virtual vertex in the middle of each face, expressed as the fn combination of the face's vertices. With this additional vertex, we span a refined triangle mesh in each polygon, on which we are then able to compute the cotangent Laplacian. However, we do not stop at this point, but course in the refined system back to the original polygon by expressing the vertex functions on the coarse mesh as linear combinations of the head basis functions on the finer one, which means we more or less distribute the vertex values of the implicit mesh back to the original nodes with the help of the affine weights. A visualization for these bases can be seen here, at the example of an L-shaped polygon. It is clear that these bases are not equivalent to the triangle the head basis function, as, depending on the weights, they also influence the polygon at the position of the virtual vertex. For example, this point has the weight 0 0.5 and is clearly affecting the middle, where this point with the weight 0 is not. As a short reminder, the cotangent Laplacian on a triangle mesh is constructed as the product of a so-called stiffness matrix S and the inverse of a mass matrix M. The division by the mass matrix gives us the point-wise formulation instead of the integrated one. The stiffness matrix is more or less responsible for the name of this discretization, as it contains cotangent weights for each vertex of the mesh in its respective one ring neighborhood. Concerning the mass matrix, there are numerous different definitions. In our case, we choose the non lumped FEM mass matrix. 
The cotangent Laplacian is so popular since it fulfills a lot of very useful properties. Badetsky and colleagues define several features a discrete Laplacian should fulfill, and so far, none was really able to retain all of them. However, the cotangent Laplacian comes very close, as it fulfills all of them with the exceptions of positive weights. That is why we use the cotangent discretization as the basis for our refined triangle mesh, because we hope to transfer all these nice properties to our new operator as well and make use of its easy and efficient construction. So, how do we construct our new operator? To transfer information between the coarse polygon and the refined triangle mesh, we follow the so-called multigrid approach that uses a prolongation and restriction operator to transfer information between res different resoluted grids, with the restriction going from fine to coarse and the prolongation going from coarse to fine. So the first step is to define a prolongation operator that virtually inserts the previously mentioned vertex within each polygon to then span the implicit triangle fan while keeping the original vertices in place. So consider our given polygon. We have six previous phase vertices and want to insert one virtual vertex, for example, the centroid, meaning uniform weights. So that the identity matrix retains the original points, where the additional row contains the weight for the representative vertices. For example, polygons of a higher degree would simply lead to more weight entries per row. After computing the coating and version on this mesh, we have to transfer the information back to the original one. Fortunately, the restriction operator is defined as the dual of the prolongation. And since our prolongation is a real value matrix, as I've just shown you, the restriction operator can be simply obtained by taking its transpose, because the dual of a real value matrix is, is transpose. With this, we are then able to define our new stiffness and mass matrix. By computing the stiffness matrix on the triangle mesh, we sandwich it with our prolongation and restriction operators, completely hiding the whole refinement step, and obtain a new matrix that lives on the cross polygon mesh. We follow the same approach for the mass matrix with one minor additional step. Because we observe that diagonalizing the matrix yields generally better results, so we lump the initial matrix to the diagonal one, which now roughly assigns each vertex one third of the surrounding triangle areas. And in the end, the polygon Laplacian is once again given as the product of a stiffness matrix and the inverse of a mass matrix, ready to be used. We are also able to retain one of the key properties of the Laplacian. Because mathematically, the Laplacian is defined as the divergence of the gradients of a function, and therefore the stiffness matrix can be divided into a divergence and gradient operator. The cotangent Laplacian already allows this factorization into gradient and divergence, here from all on called d tri and g tri. But our prolongation step gives us a similar expression, leading to a new gradient, g tri times our prolongation matrix, and a divergence expression our restriction operator p transpose times d tray. An application for this matter will be shown later. It is important to notice that the finite elements formulation makes the factorization into these two operators so easy and altogether even possible for us, which is not a given for any discretization. The one question remaining is how to define the weights for the virtual vertices. As mentioned before, we want to define a prolongation matrix but there are many different possibilities to choose for an FN combination. So, what do we want? We want the vertex to be easy to compute, as we have to do it for every phase within the mesh. Additionally, it should be unique, as well as inside the polygon in the planar case. This avoids undesirable triangle flips. For the last point, one of the previously mentioned properties of the Laplacian is linear precision. We can only, argue, we can only guarantee this for our operator if the vertex is an FN combination or at least an FM combination of the phases vertices. So, as often mentioned before, this must be a given. The easiest and fastest solution would be to simply take the mean of all the phases vertices, inserting the so-called centroid. And while this works fine for many polygons, it can unfortunately lead to undesirable triangle flips for non-context shapes, as the centroid can lie outside of the polygon. A way to conquer this behavior would be to penalize two big surface areas, a property of the Dirac Lee energy is directly able to fulfill. However, this point is not uniquely defined. For example, for convex planar polygons, the total area will be identical for every virtual vertex inside the polygon. 
Instead, we opt for the minimizer of the sum of squared triangle areas of the induced triangle fan. Now the solution is unique, even for planar convex polygons, and using the squared triangle area, the objective function becomes quadratic, which is easy to minimize. So, as a summary, centroid is easy to compute, but can lead to triangle, fa triangle flips. Minimizer of Dirac energy and absolute triangle areas are not unique, but using the minimizer of the sum of square triangle areas gives us a very nice solution, which is easy to obtain. So, to summarize, we want to find weights for our faces vertices that minimize the sum of the square triangle areas so that the weight itself forms an FN combination. With these weights, we are then able to obtain the minimizing point and the prolongation matrix and have all we need. By construction, the energy is quadratic, which means differentiating with respect to the weights gives us a linear system. We add one additional row to the matrix to enforce the partition of unity constraint, which is equivalent to, affine, to having affine weights. And then we are already done. At this point, one could argue that enforcing convex weights would be beneficial because having positive weights seems more or less desirable for our prolongation. But we observed that while having higher computational costs to obtain these convex weights, our operator does not perform better than with affine ones. So we went with affine combination. As described in the paper, the restriction step does not alter the properties of the cotangent Laplacian, yielding an easy to compute operator for polygon meshes that is able to fulfill the same properties as the standard discretization. So, how does our operator perform? In general, we implemented different quantitative and qualitative applications and compared our Laplacian to triangulating the mesh and using the cotangent Laplacian and the state-of-the-art polygon Laplacian, developed by Mark Alexa and Max Radetzky. For our first example, we implemented the conformalized mean curvature flow by Misha Kastan. And as you can see, the goal of this step is to transform the mesh into a more and more circular shape through smoothing and just clearly working well for our operator as, as it obtains a more and more spherical shape, which is iteration. Another nice application for our operator is that we are able to interpret meshes with holes as simply having large polygons, as you can see here. With this, we are able to apply geometric processing algorithms as if on a closed surface and do not have to worry about any boundary conditions. And once again, you can see that after some iterations, this mesh also converges to a spherical shape. Parameterization is not far from smoothing. And as you can see, this is also working very well for our operator. We are on the right and the solution obtained through Alexis operators on the left. Although they look very similar, we still have a slightly lower conformal distortion. For quantitative measures, we tested how well our operator is able to reconstruct the mean curvature of a unit sphere, as well as the spherical harmonics, the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on a sphere. We tested these, measure, uh, these applications on four different test measures. For example, the fine sphere, which is a high resoluted quad mesh, or the hex sphere, which uh, is constructed out of hexagons. In case of the curvature, we took the root mean squared error for our curvature obtained through the Laplacians versus the ground truth, as the mean curvature on a sphere is always one. Right now, you can see the normalized error of the mean curvature, with our value always being one. Uh, the orange bar represents triangulating the mesh and computing the typical triangle code on Laplacian. And as you can see, our Laplacian yields, yields generally the smallest errors, with the exceptions of the fine shear. In case of the spherical harmonics, we tested how well our operator is able to reproduce the discrete eigenfunctions sampled on the sphere and compared them to the analytical function values. While our operator does not yield the smallest errors, we are still in a similar range compared to the other ones and can be considered competitive. The last method we are going to show you is the computation of the geodesic distances with the help of the heat flow developed by Keen and Crane et al. The first met uh, this method involves three major steps. At first, we smooth the impulse function with a certain time step, epsilon, 
which is recommended to be the mean length, edge length of the mesh. Afterwards, we compute the gradients of the solution with the help of the gradient operator I mentioned before. To obtain the geodesic distances, we solve for a scalar field whose gradient matches the vector field G the best. For this, we need the divergence operator. And in practice, the results look like this. Right now, we see a quad mesh forming a head. And if I compute the geodesic distances for the zeroth vertex with our operator, you can see that the results are very nice. If I now do the same for our nexus operator with their recommended hyperparameter being two, the results are clearly distorted. I can now adjust the hyperparameter to different values and obtain different results. And for this specific mesh, choosing a parameter around 0.3 gives generally the best results. Although they are still a little bit distorted. Uh, Fernando Dijo and Mathieu Lebrun mentioned that choosing a larger time step improves the qualitative performance of Alexis Laplacian, which I can do. They suggested the maximum edge length of the mesh, and this clearly enhances the performance, also for larger lambda values. Now, as you can see here. But this also applies for our operator. So the larger time step also enhances our results. And we obtain very nice ESA lines. Now, uh, Crane mentioned in his paper that by running the heat flow for progressively larger time steps, one obtains smooth approximations of the geodesic distances. Therefore, enhanced qualitative results come always at the cost of accuracy. An important factor is that our operator is not equivalent to simply inserting the virtual vertex into the mesh. In this graphic, you can see the results obtained with our operator while inserting the virtual point and computing the geodesic distances with the cotens, coten divergence and gradient lead to noticeable artifacts. To compare our quantitative performance, we tested the geodesic distances on different planes since we are able to compare them to the Euclidean distances as the ground truth. And once again, on most of the meshes, our operator is able to yield the smallest errors. In the general, it's able to outperform Alexa's Laplacian. And as mentioned before, this does not change with the usage of a higher time step. To summarize this presentation, we were able to define a new discrete Laplacian for polygon meshes with the help of a virtual vertex per polygon. All the refinement steps are hidden from the user thanks to our prolongation and restriction matrices. It inherits all the desirable properties of the cotangent Laplacian, is still easy to compute, and has no parameters that have to be adjusted. An additional nice feature is that our theory is consistent with the finite elements exterior calculus. With the help of the Whitney basis functions, we are able to define a prolongation operator for 0, 1, and 2 forms, enabling us to define the respective Hotster operators. Constructing our Laplacian is also faster than our Alexa state-of-the-art polygon Laplace, which is a nice detail for real-world applications. So, if you want to try our new Laplacian, we publish the source code on GitHub under the following link, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Astrid. For the Q&A, I now welcome two of this paper's other authors. Still waiting to see them here. Okay, now you see at least one of them, it's Mario Botch. And we also have Philip Herholz here for the Q&A. Everybody in the audience, you can also still post further questions during the discussion. Um, so a first question from the audience is whether you have tried your operator on highly non-star-shaped polygons or really absurd polygons. When does the method actually break? How far can you push it? 
Um, let me maybe start by saying that it would be Astrid's turn to uh, to do the Q&A, but she unfortunately had a car accident this morning on the way to the office. She's fine, like everybody's fine, but she cannot make it. And because of that, um, myself and Philip are doing the Q&A. Um, regarding this star-shaped, um, to be, we, we assume the pod to be star-shaped. It might be non-planar, it might be non-convex, um, but for star-shaped, it more or less breaks. Maybe, Philip, you can say a bit more. I mean, it, it still works, but it doesn't give you nice results. We, we assume that there is a point in the center that we can insert. And the say, for instance, for a planar polygon, we will not have flipped polygons, flipped triangles, um, once we insert this point in the center. And if the polygon is not star-shaped, there's no such point that we can insert. So we will get flipped triangles, and the results will degrade. Yes, but, um, but maybe I might add that um, the results might degrade, but we generally see that it's quite robust. So one star, non-star shaped polygon will not break the algorithm, um, but we haven't thoroughly tested these extreme cases, like meshes that are generated in that way. Um, but we haven't seen anything, but we invite everybody to play with the code and send us the results and yeah, make it break and uh, tell us how. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. So it was justified in the talk why this um, virtual vertex is inserted or optimized based on minimizing the, the squared area as opposed to just using the, the centroid, for instance. Let's say I'm in the use case where it's all about simplicity and speed. Is there any case that can be made for just using the centroid in some use cases, or is that so risky and can so easily lead to catastrophic results that you would strongly advise against this? So Mario, should I? Should I yeah. So what, what, what we see is that it works in general, of course. I mean, this is like nothing that is like totally wrong. But if you look at the metrics we were comparing to, to other methods, uh, we would usually lose with, with that one. Um, so in terms of quantitative results, this is measurably worse. Okay. Um, maybe about the positivity. So you use this cotan based um, Laplacian, which has all these nice properties, except for the positivity or the, the maximum principle. Do you see any chance to, to modify this or to, to have a variation of this which has the positivity at the cost of losing some other property, of course? I mean, there's always the, the option to go for intrinsic Delaunay triangulations. Um, and well, we tried using this in combination with our operator. So the nice thing is if the operator has the property of, so the, under, the operator on the refined mesh has the property of positivity, this is getting inherited by our operator. Um, so we experimented with that, didn't see like much improved results, but on highly degenerated meshes, uh, this is a, an option, a way to go, but we haven't really thoroughly investigated it. Okay. Um, another question from the audience. So if you have badly shaped polygons where inserting one virtual vertex doesn't lead to nice results, is there perhaps a way to work with multiple internal virtual vertices to handle this more nicely? Um, so there's no principal reason not to do that. But as we put sim simple in the title, we opted to really just go for, for this very basic thing. But of course, you can always remesh and then restrict again uh, to the original vertices. So uh, actually, you could think of the whole paper as a more general framework, um, but, but this is definitely future work. We, we didn't really explore this direction. Let me maybe add one point. I mean, as long as the additional vertices can be expressed as an affine combination of the polygon, right, we can sandwich with the prolongation and restriction matrix. So that is one requirement, but not a very uh, bad one. I mean, this is typically what you want to have. And in the current version, we can nicely identify um, like 
gradients, for instance, with the refined triangles. And the refined triangles we can uniquely identify with the half edges of the original polygon. And this unique identification we will lose when we insert more vertices into the polygon because then we have a more general triangulation. Um, so something like discretization of um, divergence and gradient will become more involved. Okay, um, yeah, let's all virtually thank the speakers and the, the presenters again. And let's move on to the second presentation in this session. The second paper is titled Spectral Mesh Simplification, and the talk will be given by this paper's first author, Thibault Lesquart. We present a mesh simplification technique that aims to preserve the spectral properties of its input. Our mesh simplification technique is based on the Laplacian operator, which in itself is a crucial tool for a wide range of geometric applications such as mesh smoothing, remeshing, shape matching, etc. As a quick reminder, given a vertex V on the mesh, and a function f that associates a scalar to each vertex, we compute the Laplacian of f at v as the weighted sum of differences. There are several ways of computing the weights, a very common one being the sum of adjacent cotagens, which we actually use in our method. Similarly, there are several ways of computing the mass, often it is done by summing one third of the area of the neighboring triangles. The spectrum of a mesh is the spectrum of its Laplacian operator, that is, the set of eigenvalues on eigenvectors. We can manipulate it in a similar fashion to what is done for spectral sound processing or spectral image processing. Notably, we can make an analogy with Fourier series for one-dimensional analysis, in which we can decompose any function on the basis of cosinus and sinus, each one being associated with a frequency. In 3D, this is really useful for numerous tasks such as shape matching or shape descriptors, among others. However, it is ignored by most mesh simplification techniques, for example, the quadric simplification of Garland and Hegbert. Instead, we propose to focus on the low frequencies and remove irrelevant details during the simplification, effectively making our method a low pass filter. Indeed, Low frequencies capture global shape details, so preserving them is important. We are specifically interested in producing a mesh for easier interoperability with shape processing or shape analysis techniques. Let's take a mesh M with N vertices. Noting L its Laplacian operator, the spectrum is given by its eigenvalues here in the diagonal matrix lambda. Those eigenvalues are positive or null ordered and are associated with eigenvectors in the matrix phi, both of them solution to the eigenvalue problem L phi equal to phi lambda. More concretely, we can look at a single eigenvector as a function associating a scalar for each vertex of the mesh, which we can color code. It is also a solution to the eigenvalue problem with its corresponding eigenvalue. This is a fifth eigenvector on this mesh, and here is a 6th, 35th, and 36th. Continuing the analogy with one-dimensional spectral analysis, each eigenvector here corresponds to a frequency in one dimension, and they form a basis on which we can decompose arbitrary functions. For example, the function that associates the x position of a vertex. For a meaningful simplification, we will remove the high frequencies and only keep the low ones, so we will focus on the first eigenvectors. Work has already been done in this direction. First, there is a wide literature regarding mesh simplification, but often for shape matching purposes, people use the quadric simplification of Garland and Hegbert in 97, which does not preserve the spectrum. 
This is because it focuses on the appearance, however, it does output a mesh. More closely related to ours, Nazikun and colleagues in 2018 proposed to approximate the Laplacian of a mesh, effectively producing a simplified shape that preserves the spectrum, although the output is not a mesh, but an approximated Laplacian defined on a subset of the input vertices. Liu and colleagues in 2019 introduced a method to coarsen geometric operators by removing rows and columns, which geometrically corresponds to selecting a subset of the vertices. They do not produce a mesh. In contrast, we produce a mesh while still preserving the spectrum. It is to note that the output Laplacian is simply evaluated on the output mesh, as for the quadric simplification, whereas the method of Nazikon and colleagues and Liu and colleagues specifically optimize for the output Laplacian. Our simplification algorithm is quite simple and follows the traditional error-driven progressive edge collapse schemes. First, we associate a cost to each edge that can be collapsed. Then, we select the one with the lowest cost, we collapse it, and update the cost of its neighbors. We repeat these three steps until we reach the desired number of output vertices. The important part here is not this simple algorithm, but the metric used to determine the cost of an edge. We need some notation to describe the metric. Let m tilde be the output mesh with small m vertices. More generally, any notation with a tilde refers to the output. We express the output vertices in function of the input ones via the restriction matrix P. All rows sum to 1 on this matrix is usually binary. Instead of trying to minimize something directly depending on the eigenvectors or eigenvalues, which would be highly nonlinear, we optimize the commutativity between the Laplacian operator L and the restriction P that we highlight in red. F represents the functions we aim to preserve. Here is the intuition. When going from a function on the detailed input mesh to its equivalent on the output coarse mesh, we want that taking its Laplacian before restricting it should yield the same result as restricting the function first before taking its Laplacian. Regarding the rest of the metric, we use a weighted norm on the coarse mesh. On the matrix F, is the signals we want to focus on when optimizing for the commutativity. We take f as the first k eigenvectors to explicitly represent the k lowest frequencies. Note that taking f equal to identity would select all frequencies and yield poor results, as the optimization would try to keep high frequencies even though there wouldn't be enough vertices on the coarse mesh to represent these high frequencies. This metric is global but we don't want to recompute global eigenvectors for each edge collapse. So, looking at the weighted norm, we can write it as a product of diagonals since the mass matrix is diagonal. Thus, we can write it as a linear combination of the norm of each row, which will allow us to decompose the global metric per vertex. Note that here, the only varying quantities are the mass of the vertex, the restriction matrix P, and the coarse Laplacian LTD. This only depends on edge neighborhoods, so we can update the global cost via local adjustments, which is very good for speed. When collapsing an edge, we need to adjust the position of the resulting vertex, and this will have an effect on P. We want the position that minimizes the cost metric. We choose to place it on the edge, so we have only one parameter to describe the position, making it straightforward to update the restriction matrix. Moreover, the cost metric is nonlinear, so we approximate it via a degree 2 polynomial, which we minimize to find both the optimal position of the collapse and its cost. 
Now we evaluate our method. First, we look at eigenvectors comparing between those on the input mesh or simplification on the quadric simplification of Garland and Hegberg. The specific target here was to preserve the first 100 eigenvectors. We can see that the fifth one is well preserved by both methods. Note also that our simplification technique erased most small details in contrast with the quadric simplification. The sixth eigenvector is also well preserved, but the quadric simplification does not preserve correctly the 35th and further eigenvectors. Indeed, our methods show a good preservation of the highest of the low frequencies and more generally of the spectrum. We can also look at the eigenvalues, here the first 100 eigenvalues of the detail mesh. Those from our coarse mesh are similar, although not exactly the same, while those from a mesh reduced with the quadric simplification diverge more. The methods of Nazicon and colleagues, and especially the one of Liu and colleagues, are much closer to the input spectrum at the cost of not outputting a mesh. Directly looking at eigenvalues on eigenvectors is not sufficient. We need an objective evaluation. We do it through functional maps between detailed and coarse meshes. Functional maps are matrices, here k by k, that allows to transfer function across shapes, here between the input and output meshes. They were introduced by Ovsianikov and colleagues in 2012. Ideally, they are diagonal or block diagonal to account for eigenvalue multiplicity. In our context, they are useful as they allow to measure how well low frequency eigenvectors of the Laplacians are preserved. We introduce two norms on these maps for an objective evaluation. First, the Laplacian commutativity, which puts more formally the idea that the spectrum, that is, the eigenvalues, should not change between fine and coarse meshes. And second, the orthonormality, following the idea that the ideal functional map is the identity. We prove that having both norms equal to zero imply a perfect preservation of the spectrum. Indeed, more formally, this means that these three statements are equivalent. First, both norms are equal to zero. Second, when transferring all frequencies from fine mesh to coarse mesh, not only the resulting vectors are the eigenvectors of the eigenvalue problem on the coarse mesh, but also the fine and coarse eigenvalues are the same. And third, the same that's the second point, but in the other way. Let's observe the typical behavior with regard to this norm on a mesh with 21,000 vertices. Here, k is equal to 100, so we aim to preserve 100 eigenvectors. For both norms, we see that the less vertices we have on the left, the harder it is for our method to preserve the spectrum. This behavior is also visible for the quadric simplification and the method of Nazicon and colleagues. Contrary to simplifying or approximating the input, for which the quality of the output gets worse with less vertices, the method of Liu and colleagues specifically optimized for the output Laplacian, which means the quality is degraded with more vertices because the optimization is harder. Here is a functional map on its norms when simplifying this mesh to only 3% of its initial size. It is much closer to being diagonal than with the quadric simplification of Garland and Hegber. At the cost of not producing a mesh, both the methods of Nazicon and colleagues and Liu and colleagues attain more faithful results. It is to note that contrary to these methods, we tackle an inverse problem. That is, we optimize the connectivity on vertex positions to preserve the spectrum instead of directly manipulating the Laplacian. Our method requires two parameters, 
the number of output vertices, and the number of eigenvectors to preserve. To aid choosing this last parameter, we plot the norms as a function of the ratio between the parameters. While the Laplacian commutativity is more sensitive, we observe that past 30% both norms increase, which leads to the informal goal of always having at least three times as many output vertices as eigenvectors to preserve. By construction, our methods on the quadric simplification are deterministic, but this is not the case for the method of Nazikon and colleagues and Liu and colleagues, since they rely on the random initialization. This can lead to varying results on timings. Speaking of which, here we show the typical performance behaviors with the same kind of plot done for the norms. Since our method on the quadric simplification are based on a simple edge contraction algorithm, the total time is in function of removed vertices. The simplicity of the quadric simplification makes it very fast here. However, as the methods of Nazikon and colleagues and Lyon colleagues specifically optimize for the output Laplacian, they become slower for large inputs. We observe that most of the time is spent in the initialization phase for large inputs, that is, computing k eigenvectors of the input. This step can be made faster with a better eigen solver, which is an orthogonal research problem. By plotting the time collapsing edges as a function of the removed vertices, we confirm that our reduction time is indeed linear in the number of contract edges. Now, Let's talk about some applications. The first application of our method is for faster spectral distances. Here, look at the isolines. Compared to the quadric simplification, we show a more faithful diffusion distance, the harmonic distance, commute time distance, wave kernel signature and heat kernel signature for different time parameters. Another application is to enable faster shape matching on meshes with BCICP, a friend and colleagues in 2018. This method yields a functional map between two meshes, but performance-wise it does not scale to large meshes. The solution is to simplify the meshes, usually with the quadric simplification of Garland and Hegbert, and then match the coarse meshes before solving for the functional map between the detailed meshes. When simplifying with our method, we obtain better correspondences, as shown by these cumulative histograms of correspondences as a function of geodesic error. Overall, we introduced a new mesh simplification method that uses a simple edge decimation algorithm with a novel metric to preserve the spectrum and which has applications such as shape matching and shape modeling. The code is open source and available on GitLab. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I now have Thibaut here to answer your questions. Um, everybody in the audience, if you have further questions, feel free to post them as we speak. So as a first question, you mentioned in the talk that the collapsed vertex position is optimized along the edge. Can you say anything about how hard it would be to optimize this in a more unrestricted manner and whether it would be worth the effort? So we actually tried uh, three strategies uh, for the uh, output position. So the first one was just taking the middle of the edge. The second one was what I presented, uh, the restricting it on the edge. And the third one was uh, unrestricted. Uh, on the first point about uh, the uh, unrestricted optimization is that uh, it's way more costly in terms of, of performance. 
Uh, and the second problem is that uh, usually it's kind of uh, uh, overfit uh, in some way. So we had uh, worse results uh, than uh, with just uh, restricting it along the edge. Uh, also, if we don't restrict the position on the edge, it's uh, harder to, um, to update the restriction matrix. So uh, we, we have more details of this in the paper. Uh, so that's why we chose uh, the restriction as the best compromise, uh, because yeah, the first strategy of just taking the metal is also not uh, always good. Uh, too simplistic and uh, it uh, loses a lot of details. So yeah, that's why we restrict. Okay. Um, another question. Can you say anything on resulting mesh quality in terms of element quality? Is there any observation or any reason to expect that your objective will yield particularly nice or particularly bad elements or is there no relation at all? So we observed um, that usually the meshes after the, our reduction uh, have equilateral triangles or close to. Uh, it tends to uh, yeah, the, um, uniformly distribute the, the, the connectivity some, somehow, uh, but it's not uh, something we put in the paper because we don't have a, a formal evaluation of it, uh, like measuring the average angles or the angles deficit or things like that. Okay. Uh, we observed uh, also that um, for the quadric simplification, often the uh, elements, the triangles are very thin, the slivers on this uh, have a has a high impact on the numerical stability for Laplacian uh, problems, for example. OK, another question from the audience. Do you think that your method could be combined with the method in the previous paper to handle non-triangular meshes? Uh, Yes, I think uh, I think definitely uh, with a bit of work it could definitely be feasible uh, as extension. So either mesh with polygons, uh, which are not triangles, should be feasible. And also uh, the trihedral meshes should also be feasible, although way more uh, costly in terms of. I think it's possible to extend it as uh, okay. I think it's quite simple. And. Um... Maybe one final question. Can you say anything on how the objective behaves in terms of extrinsic geometric error, Hausdorff distance or something like this? Or is this a stupid question because applications that rely on spectral properties don't care about extrinsic shape at all in general? Uh, well, this one is a bit harder. Um, I think uh, this uh, will well. With this, will remove all details. So, uh, the, the one important point about it is the way it uh, changes the connectivity. Because if it's just changing the shape, the shape, uh, one could filter the mesh using uh, Laplacian uh, and keep the same amount of connectivity, but. This is a problem for a lot of uh, subsequent methods. So a big motivation is actually reducing the number of elements, not, not just adjusting the shape. Um, and I think most details uh, which are important in terms of appearance, in terms of shape, uh, are not that important uh, for, uh, for example, shape matching uh, applications. OK. Then, yeah, let's all thank virtually um, Thibault again, and then we can move on to the third paper in this session. Um, Thibault just mentioned some issues or bad elements in, in quadric error-based uh, simplification. I think in the next talk, we will see something and hear something about this. So this next paper is titled Fast and Robust Quadric Error Function Minimization Using Probabilistic Quadrics. And this talk will be given by the first author, Philip Tretner.
Hello and welcome to my Eurographics talk about fast and robust quadratic error function minimization using probabilistic quadrics. I'm Philip Tretner and I hope I can provide you with some new insights about an old tool in geometry processing. What I want to sh uh, share with you today is a new way to define error quadrics, which is a very useful tool that you can apply in different topics such as decimation, isosurfic extraction, mesh smoothing or surface interpolation. In general, error quadrics represent different kinds of quadratic distances, such as distances to points, lines, planes, or also transformations thereof. A useful property of error quadrics is that when you've constructed error quadrics to multiple objects, you can sum up the resulting 4x4 matrices and end up with something rep representing the summed quadratic distance, similar to an L2 norm. You can then proceed to find the point that minimizes this combined error quadric and this is some kind of best fit position. And for example, when you have multiple planes, it will default to the intersection of these planes. However, in the classical settings, input meshes are often treated as ground truth. All the input triangles are treated as exact and when you construct quadrics for them and use them, for example, in a decimation process, what happens is that um, the exact algorithm wants to minimize the loss of information and your feature preservation turns into a noise preservation. In this paper we looked at how to model the input noise and basically bake the resulting uncertainty directly into the quadric. So why is this important? When we're working with error quadrics, for example here two planes that are defined by a position and a normal, so even small uncertainties can result in dramatic changes. So here the normals are noisy and can change within this small black ellipse. And when we find the point minimizing the sum of the two quadrics, it ends up uh, having quite a huge spread. This problem gets even worse if we are in coplanar regions, where a small change in the normals can lead to dramatically different results, which basically make most of the algorithms unstable if they don't handle this. If we have a model for the input uncertainty, we can cast the problem in a probabilistic framework and try to find some kind of expected best fit. This is conceptually similar to taking many samples from the input distribution, summing up the resulting quadric, and then after conceptually infinitely many samples, find the minimizer of that quadric. And what we've done in our paper is derived a closed form solution so that we can compute this green expected minimizer without the sampling approach. Our method turns out to be surprisingly simple. First you take your input quadric, which is a 4x4 matrix, and compute the expected value of it over your input uncertainty. Then, instead of using the input quadric directly, you minimize the quadratic distance over the expectation of the quadric. And that's it. That's all you need to apply our method. And this expectation over a quadric is what we call the probabilistic quadric. If you apply this method, it turns out that uh, this is not only more robust against noise and beneficial even for clean meshes, but it's also a lot faster to work with probabilistic quadrics because the minimization can avoid using a singular value decomposition. Okay, let's start with a simple concrete example, the ubiquitous plane quadric. And this also serves as a small refresher on quadrics in general. So the plane quadric is defined by a point Q and a normal N, and its quadratic distance is given by x minus Q dot N squared. If you expand that, you end up with a term quadratic in X, a term linear in X, and a constant. Or if you prefer to write that in homogeneous coordinates, it's just X transpose QX. And this is the general form of a quadric, this 4x4 four four matrix Q, composed of the three parts A, B, and C. Traditionally, given such a quadric, the point minimizing the quadric is given by A inverse B. However, in practice, A is often close to singular, especially in coplanar regions, which makes this process quite unstable, and instead a more robust version is used, which decomposes A using singular value decomposition, and then uses the pseudo-inverse to find a least norm solution for the minimizer. Note that for the best fit you only need A and B and the constant C is only required if you want to evaluate the value of a quadric, which is for example needed in incremental decimation for the prior key of the priority queue. 
Let's take the classical plane quadric and cast that into our probabilistic setting. So instead of a single plane defined by position and normal, we now have a set of planes defined by distributions over normals and positions. To make the formulas tractable, we've chosen to model these input uncertainties via Gaussian distributions. For our probabilistic quadrics, we need to compute the expectation over A, B and C. The expectation over A turns out to be quite simple, because the expected value of n and transposed is just the second moment of the Gaussian distribution and has a closed form solution. And here we can already see a recurring pattern with our probabilistic quadrics. First, we have a classical part that only depends on the means of our input distribution. And we have a probabilistic part that also depends on the covariances. The expectation over B is slightly more complex, but it gets simpler because we assume that N and Q are independent. So we again end up with a classical part and probabilistic part. The expectation over C is even more involved. And here the, uh, we have two kinds of probabilistic parts, one kind that is linear in the covariances and one part that models the interdependence of the covariance of N and Q. Let's take another look at the structure of our probabilistic quadrix. So we have this classical part and we have the probabilistic part and whenever the input is getting less uncertain, which means the covariances go to zero, we end up recovering the classical parts. There are also two interpretations of this probabilistic plane quadric that I find quite insightful. The first one is that we can view the probabilistic plane quadric as the sum of the classical quadric and the point quadric, which is the quadratic distance between x and q, weighted by the covariance. And there is a second interpretation that is useful and also sheds some light on the stability of our method, which is more related to the minimization process itself which is that you can say that the probabilistic quadric is a minimization of the classical quadric using generalized Tikhonov regularization. So instead of only minimizing ax minus b squared, we are also adding this regularization term. And this uh, motivates why our method is more robust than the classical minimization. Plane quadrics are not the only type of quadric we've considered in our work. Especially if you use them per phase on a mesh, you run into a few problems with the plane quadrics. First, there's no distinction between small and large triangles, and the triangulation has a larger impact on the quadrics. Second, you need to estimate the uncertainty of your normals, which can be quite hard because the noise is on a mesh usually given per vertex and not on the phase normals. This also leads us to the third problem that if you have small and noisy triangles, it's easy to get flips and foldovers, which basically require you to have a really large covariance in N because now the normal is not reliable at all. The second type of quadric we've examined is what we call the triangle quadric, which was already used by Lindstrom 20 years ago to simplify large polygonal models. The triangle quadric is defined using the three positions of the triangle and it is given by n and transposed, where n is not the uh, classical normal vector, but rather this four-dimensional vector comprised of pairwise cross products of the position and the negative determinant of the 3 by 3 matrix given by the positions. This triangle quadric is automatically area weighted. However, it still has problems for small or highly anisotropic triangles because there even a small amount of noise can lead to foldovers and thus unreliable normals. When cast into our probabilistic framework, instead of a single triangle defined by three vertices, we have a set of triangles defined by three distribution over the vertices. And here we've chosen these distributions to be Gaussian distributions again. This makes the formulas a little bit more simple, however they are still um, more complex than would fit on the slide. However, they follow the same uh, structure than the probabilistic plane quadrics, which means we have this classical part, which is really just this n n transposed. And we have the probabilistic part, where a and b depend linearly on the covariances and quadratically on the covariances and the expectation over C 
additionally depends cubically on the covariances. In general, if you want to construct probabilistic quadrics for any kind of quadric and input distribution, it is actually not that hard to do. So, given some set of objects that you have quadrics for, and you have a distribution over these objects, it turns out that if you compute the expected value over the quadratic distances, this is the same as the quadratic distance over the expected quadric. And this expectation over a quadric is what we call the probabilistic quadric, and this is just another 4x4 matrix, so you can use that whenever uh, or wherever you use a quadric in your current application. The main difficulty here is deriving short formulas, but you can also use, for example, Monte Carlo integration techniques to construct the probabilistic quadric in a Monte Carlo fashion. Let's take a look at how our probabilistic quadrics behave. And for that we've chosen incremental decimation, which showcases the minimizer and also the value of the quadric, because that's used in, as key in the priority queue. So in this simple experiment we've taken a regularly tessellated cube and decimate that using our uh, probabilistic plane quadric and also the classical plane quadric. And here it turns out that even on basically clean input meshes, the probabilistic quadric is um, feature preserving, but it also prefers uniform triangulations, where the classical plane quadric in coplanar regions produces quite ugly triangulations. In this experiment, we want to showcase the structure of our probabilistic plane quadric as the sum of a point quadric and the classical plane quadric. The point quadric itself is not feature preserving at all, but it produces more uniform triangulations, and our probabilistic plane quadric is basically taking the best of these two worlds. Showing the difference between the plane and the triangle quadric is not super easy, but in this experiment we've taken a mesh with a little bit of noise, but a varying uh, size of triangles. And here, if you look closely, you can see that the plane quadric preserves the input triangulation more than the triangle quadric. Now, let's see what our quadrics do in the presence of noise. So here we have an input mesh with varying sizes of noise. And if you look at the classical triangle quadric, it will happily decimate the planar regions, but it is reluctant to decimate the noisy parts because it treats them as features. Whereas our probabilistic triangle quadric can even decimate these noisy parts because we've chosen the covariance so that is, it is slightly larger than the noise value. It turns out that it doesn't even matter if the modeled input distribution, which is a Gaussian for our triangle quadrics, matches perfectly the noise that you have in your mesh. So in this example we have constructed a mesh with, uh, with a peaky noise, which is similar to salt and pepper noise for images. And here you see that the classical playing quadric yeah, basically preserves all these little uh, peaks and our triangle quadric immediately gets rid of them because they are below the noise threshold. Let's take a look at the numerical robustness of our quadrics and this will also lead us to the reason why our quadrics are faster than the classical parts. So the classical way to minimize the quadric in a robust manner is to use a singular value decomposition on A and then use this decomposition to compute x min via a pseudo inverse, which will by on default choose the minimizer closest to the origin and usually you have some specific fallback position in mind, which is this x hat construction here. In contrast, our probabilistic quadrics can be solved or minimized using A inverse B because the matrix A is never singular if you have a positive covariance. This numerical robustness 
is the reason why there is no need to use a singular value decomposition with our probabilistic quadrix and this is actually a huge benefit for the performance. So here we've taken three libraries to compute small singular value decompositions of 3x3 three three matrices and benchmark their performance. So in CPU cycles we have roughly between 1200 and 1600 cycles per singular value decomposition. If you compare that to simply solving A inverse B, you get up a speed up of a factor of around 50 and you only need 17 cycles per operation. So we gain a huge speed up in minimizing the quadric. However, constructing the quadrics becomes a bit more expensive. Classically, the plain quadric takes around 12 or 13 cycles, depending on if you need the scalar C or not. In our probabilistic setting, this increases to 17 or 35 cycles per operation. However, sometimes you do not need the full covariance matrices and can take an isotropic version of them where you only have a single scalar quantifying the uncertainty. And in these isotropic cases, um, we get 12 to 15 cycles per operation, so it's not really slower than the classical part. The probabilistic triangle quadric, however, is more complex to compute and thus also more expensive in the construction. The classical part takes between 20 and 21 cycles and the full probabilistic part takes around 10 times as long with 210 to 260 cycles per operation. Here again, if you only need an isotropic noise model, you regain some of the performance, but you still have around 90 cycles per operation left. So to summarize the timings, in the classical setting, you have a very cheap construction. However, computing the minimizer of the quadric has to be done via singular value decomposition for stability reasons. And this is by far the dominating operation here. In contrast, our probabilistic quadrics are more expensive to construct. And the most expensive one is the anisotropic version of the triangle quadric when you also need the constant C, where it is a bit more than 10 times as expensive. However, we more than regain this disadvantage by not requiring a singular value decomposition and this more often used step of computing the minimizer is a factor of 50 cheaper. This leads us to the conclusion of my talk and I have three different takeaways that I want to share with you. First, I want to encourage you to not treat your input data as the ground truth because in many practical settings this is not realistic. Your input might be the result of some physical process or even if your input comes from CAD software, uh, your triangle mesh is only an approximation of some smooth surface. So what you can do is model the input uncertainty and this turns out to be beneficial even for otherwise clean inputs. And in this particular paper, we've derived closed form solution for planes and triangles under Gaussian noise. My second takeaway for you is more of a mathematical insight, which is that the expectation of a quadric is just another 4x4 matrix, it's just another quadric that you can directly use in your applications. And for example, the probabilistic plane quadric has a rather simple structure, it's easy to construct, but even if you have more complex distribution, we've provided a general recipe to construct arbitrary probabilistic quadrics. My final takeaway for you is of more practical nature, which is that probabilistic quadrics are more robust and faster to minimize than their classical counterparts. And this is because as long as your covariance is non-zero, probabilistic quadrics are always full rank, and thus there is no need to use a singular value decomposition to compute the minimizer, and you can simply use A inverse B for that. And it turns out that this is roughly 50 times faster than the singular value decomposition. And it is now possible to perform many million quadric related operations per second on a single CPU core. And this marks the end of my presentation. 
we have already set up a publication page and I've made a C++ reference implementation available under the MIT license. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, again, everybody in the audience, feel free to keep posting your questions as we speak here. Um, maybe let me start with the first question about this. So um, let's say I have a non-noisy mesh without any uncertainty. It was specifically designed the way it is. Then your method essentially reduces to the classical method. Is there a way to still benefit from the nice properties of your method, like stability in near planar or planar regions? Do I need to invent some kind of fake uncertainty there? Do you have some, some guidelines on how to choose that? So if you choose the covariance to be exactly zero, you lose the property that you um, yeah, have the stability because uh, yeah, you need a non-zero covariance. But you can choose it um, very, very small. So for example, 0.1% um, normal distribution error or something like that will basically lead to um, yeah, no noticeable difference in the feature preservation, but you still get um, the stability and this uh, isotropic or more regular triangulation property. So yeah, you have to invent a small, but really just a small uncertainty there. Okay. One question from the audience. Is there a formal connection to Gaussian product subdivision? Um, yes, uh, there is. So basically, um, we yeah realized that uh, in the end that um, when we use our method to do surface interpolation, we end up with an equivalent formulation than the Gaussian product subdivision. So yes, it turns out that if you um, annotate vertices with um, probabilistic quadrics and you interpolate the quadrics along the face and use the minimizer of the quadric as a new position, you end up with um, yeah, the equivalent of a Gaussian product subdivision there. Okay, nice. Um, so after the, the original quadric error-based mesh simplification algorithm was proposed, there were a bunch of follow-up works that um, extended this by taking additional data into account in the quadrics, like additional surface signals like color, or in the case of deforming meshes, animated meshes, multiple animation frames, and so on. Would your approach extend to this kind of trivially, or does this require some major case-by-case -case analysis? Um, depending on the distributions of these additional properties, I would say it's more or less trivial. So if you can model them by rather simple Gaussian distributions, then um, it's very easy to just adapt the formulas. But um, yeah, in general, you need to compute this expectation over the quadric. And if you have a very complex distribution, you might have to uh, invest some time simplifying the formulas there. But yeah, in principle, it, it extends nicely. Mm -hmm. And maybe a little bit related to that, uh, you mentioned this assumption about uh, the linear independence of the distributions. Let's say I have some very specific knowledge of my uncertainty and there is, well, dependence. Does that make things very different or is it rather easy to, to also handle this? Um, it depends again on your distributions because you have to compute an expected value over uh, your quadric. And if you have um, yeah, too many dependencies there, you cannot really simplify this expected value too much. But um, yeah, basically as a, uh, as a last measure, you can always just use a Monte Carlo approach um, take some samples from your input distribution and average them. And that also leads to a more robust formulation, even though you don't um, closely follow the input distribution. Okay. Um, I see no further questions. So let's all virtually thank Philip again. And then we can move on to the fourth and last paper in this session. And this 
paper is titled Subdivision Specialized Linear Algebra Kernels for Static and Dynamic Mesh Connectivity on the GPU. And the talk will now be given by the first author, Daniel Naka. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining my talk today. Mesh subdivision lets us represent smooth freeform surfaces as coarse control meshes, which are evaluated using iterative refinement, where new vertices are added to the mesh and existing ones are updated. Subdivision surfaces were already introduced in the 70s through the concerted effort of several pioneering researchers. In 97, they were first used by Pixar in an animation movie called Gary's Game, which sparked a rapid increase in popularity of subdivision surfaces. Nowadays, they've become a cornerstone in the movie industry and even found their way into video games. Which is why many efforts were made to evaluate subdivision surfaces efficiently in parallel. In general, there are two main categories of parallel subdivision approaches. Patch-based approaches split the mesh into patches, which can be subdivided independently. While these can be parallelized efficiently, patches have to overlap, introducing redundant data and redundant computations. Furthermore, cracks between patch boundaries might be introduced due to floating point errors. Table based approaches are very efficient in re evaluating vertex data, for example in animated meshes during rendering. But subdivision tables depend on the mesh connectivity and their computation accounts to a full symbolic subdivision, which is expensive. Table based approaches, such as the current industry standard Open Subdiv, perform very well in rendering, where mesh connectivity is considered static. But their applicability in other use cases, like modeling and design of subdivision meshes, is limited. Whenever a connectivity changing operation is applied to the mesh, a recomputation of the tables is performed, which introduces unpleasant idle times for the artist. Therefore, different approaches are used in different stages of the production pipeline. The results of these approaches vary in detail, causing discrepancies in the results. We propose a one-stop shop solution for efficient mesh subdivision that can act as a drop-in replacement for the different approaches. Our approach is motivated by sparse linear algebra formalizations, which are easy to understand and manipulate by all practitioners. Furthermore, the descriptions are platform independent and basic linear algebra systems are available for almost any hardware. We use a sparse matrix as the underlying mesh representation called the mesh matrix. Each face in the mesh corresponds to a column in the matrix and each vertex is represented by a row. Here in this example, the first column corresponds to the first face has non-zero entries in the rows of its vertices. The values of these non-zero entries are the traversal order of the vertices when traversing the face in winding order. There are many different subdivision schemes that lead to different results with different properties. Probably the most commonly used is Kepmel Clark subdivision, which can be applied to polygonal meshes and exclusively produces quotes independent of the input face type. While we have multiple schemes in the paper, this talk will be focused on Kepmel Clark, which consists of four steps. In the first step, a face point is computed for each face, as the average of the face's vertices. The second step computes an edge point for each edge, as the average of its endpoints and the two adjacent face points. The third step updates the vertices of the control mesh using a linear combination of the vertices in the wandering neighborhood. The last step reconnects the new vertices to build the refined topology. For the face points, we need the number of vertices in each face. We can compute face orders efficiently using the mapped SPMV here. The notation tells us that we map each non-zero value in the mesh matrix to 1 during the multiplication. We are only using the sparsity pattern of the matrix and substitute the data on the fly without generating additional data explicitly. This mapped SPMV effectively counts the number of non-zero values in each column, which is equal to the number of vertices in each face. A mapped multiplication of the transposed mesh matrix with the positions efficiently computes the face points. We substitute each value in a column by the reciprocal of the corresponding face's order to average the face's vertices to a face point. As from the second iteration on, all faces in the mesh are quotes, we can omit the computation of face orders and substitute all values by one fourth. To compute an edge point, we need the two end points and the two adjacent face points. We can generate this information using a mapped SPGEM. During this multiplication, we multiply a row of M with a column of its transpose, both corresponding to a vertex. Whenever two non-zero entries meet, we call this a collision. Such a collision only happens when the corresponding vertices share a face. What is actually the information we want to extract from this multiplication? We want to know that face L borders the edge IJ. 
In a conventional matrix multiplication, the two non-zero values would be multiplied and accumulated. What we do instead, whenever a collision happens, is to call a lambda function with the information about the collision. We know that a collision happened between vertex i and j in phase k, and we have the non-zero values that cause the collision, the position of the vertices inside the phase. But this is not quite enough, because the result would now be the sum of the two neighboring phase indices, because we will get one collision per shared phase of i and j. This is where our action maps come into play. These action maps encode relations between vertices inside a phase. This action map here encodes counterclockwise connectivity inside a phase. It tells us that the first vertex is connected to the second one, the second to the third one, and so on. When we multiply row i with column j, the lambda function will now only return the phase index for the collision in phase L. Using f, we can simply compute all edge points because it stores the indices of neighboring phases for each edge. What remains is the assignment of indices to each edge. To enumerate mesh edges, one can simply enumerate the upper triangular part of its undirected vertex vertex adjacency matrix. We can create a matrix that has the same sparsity pattern as the adjacency matrix using a similar action map to SPGM as before. Now the map encodes both clockwise and counterclockwise edges and the lambda function simply returns the map value. For each pair of vertices, we get a number of collisions equal to the number of faces they share. The resulting matrix holds the number of shared faces for any pair of vertices. We can assign unique indices to the upper triangular part and thereby to the edges. With this information, the edge points can be computed. In the next step, we have to update the control vertices. The update can be split into three terms, each depending on the valency of the vertex. The vertex valency can be computed similar to the face orders using a mapped SPMP. By replacing non-zero entries by 1, we count the number of faces around each vertex. The first term can be computed in customary ways as it is just an element-wise operation. The second term averages the neighboring vertices. We do that using a mapped SPMV of the matrix F with the positions. Each row in F corresponds to a vertex and has non-zero entries in columns corresponding to its neighbors. Each non-zero value in a row is then substituted by the valency-dependent term. The third term computes a weighted average of phase points around each vertex. A mapped SPMV of the mesh matrix with the vector of phase points computes the average efficiently, as each row in M corresponds to a vertex and has non-zero entries in columns corresponding to neighboring faces. After this third step, all refined vertices have been computed. What remains is the topology refinement. This is similar to the computation of F from before, in that we want to create one output per directed edge in the mesh. Now instead of a phase index, we want to output one of the faces in the refined mesh. In this small example, let's first look at the edge between vertex i and j. During the multiplication, we will get the collision between these vertices, and the map will confirm that they are connected in counterclockwise order in that phase. This means the lambda function will generate an output, namely the refined phase that borders the edge. The refined phase generated comprises the index of the original vertex, the index of the outgoing edge point, the index of the phase point, and the index of the edge point on the incoming edge. This refined phase is stored in Tij. As the multiplication progresses, we will get the total of four collisions in that quad, each emitting one of its refined phases. At this point, we have a formalization of Kepmel Clark subdivision that is completely platform independent. Now we can take this further and make the step to the GPU. Our approach is implemented in CUDA, so I will use CUDA nomenclature in the following discussion. We slightly modified standard SPMP and SPGEM kernels in order to enable the usage of MAPs and Lambda functions. These operations require a large amount of independent computations and therefore comprise a lot of potential parallelism. These modified kernels are great for prototyping and already provide very good performance. Moreover, the implementation is abstracted from the application as the SPLA operations steer the data movement and MAPs and Lambda functions determine the actual result. That also means that applications that implement these formalisms will profit from future performance increases in SPLA kernels. But as we will see in a minute, the formalizations hint to even more efficient implementations. We can use the knowledge about the domain and the underlying data in order to optimize the standard kernels to further increase efficiency. We use the compressed sparse column format to represent sparse matrices in our implementation. The CSC format consists of a total of three arrays. The first two store one entry per non-zero entry in the matrix, namely a row index and the corresponding value. 
A third array stores the beginning of each column in the other two arrays. Column offsets and row indices determine the sparsity pattern of the matrix and the values store the actual data. In the following I want to show you two small examples and how our formalization steered the specializations of these kernels. The first example is the computation of phase points in a quote mesh. This is the pseudocode of a straightforward implementation that does not consider any knowledge about the underlying data or the domain. What happens here is that each thread works on one column. First it determines the start of its column in the column pointer array and then starts to read the row indices one by one. For each of the row indices it reads the corresponding vector entry and accumulates them. After all entries in the thread's column have been summed up, the value is averaged and the final phase point is written to the thread's output vector element. But we actually know a bit more about the underlying data. First, the fact that each column has exactly four entries renders the column pointer obsolete. Therefore, we can assign one thread to each row index. Four consecutive threads work together to compute a single phase point. They do so by reading their row index and the corresponding vector element. The vector data is then summed up in a parallel reduction using fast warp level communication primitives. Then the final phase point can again be computed by averaging the accumulated value. The second example is the map disp gem that performs the mesh connectivity refinement. A sparse matrix matrix multiplication usually involves multiplication of each row of the left matrix with every column of the right matrix. As we are multiplying a mesh matrix with its transpose, we can avoid a large number of computations. We know that we will not get a non-zero entry in the result if the two vertices do not share a phase, because no collision will ever happen. When we now only multiply vectors that actually cause a collision, there will still be invocations of the lambda function that return zero, because the map does not confirm the encoded relationship between the vertices. This means we know exactly which pairs of vertices will generate a non-zero result. Those vertices that are connected by an edge in counterclockwise order in any phase. This speeds up the computation drastically. In the bottom right we see the pseudocode of the optimized map disp gem. Similar to the previous example, we can now parallelize over the non-zero entries of the mesh matrix. Each thread handles a single collision and produces one refined mesh phase. First, each thread reads the vertex index of the original vertex it is assigned to. To determine the edge point on the outgoing edge, each thread needs to know the next vertex in the phase. As this index is already known by the thread assigned to it, we can use efficient warp level communications to determine it. With V0 and Vn, the thread now uses E to determine the index of the first edge point. The index of the phase point can be computed from the thread's position in the row indices, as each phase has exactly four entries. The last index of the new phase is the index of the edge point on the incoming edge. This index was already determined by the predecessor thread in the phase and can therefore be communicated efficiently using warp level primitives again. Now each thread holds one refined phase in registers. The result can be written to memory using efficient vectorized stores with perfect write access, as consecutive threads write consecutive refined phases. This already concludes the topology refinement. In the evaluation we compare three approaches. First, our implementation of Capmel Clark using standard SPMB and SPGEM kernels that were only slightly modified to allow for action maps and lambda functions. The second version of our approach uses the specialized kernels that take into account the underlying data and the domain knowledge. The third approach is the current industry standard OpenSubdiv, which operates in two steps. They perform pre-processing on the CPU where they refine the topology and compute their subdivision tables. In the second step, they use the pre-computed subdivision tables on the GPU to refine the vertex data. All our evaluations were performed on an Intel i7-7700 with 32GB of RAM and a GTX 1080 Ti. Before we discuss the numbers, let's first see Slack and OpenSubdiv in action in a short modeling session. For both approaches, we show the preview of the subdivision surfaces at level 5. In this demo, we apply simple modeling operations to the control mesh of the big guy model. While Slack shows instantaneous updates of the subdivided results, OpenSubdiv requires trips to the CPU on every connectivity changing modification to recompute the subdivision tables, which introduces these unpleasant delays and clearly breaks the interactive feel of the whole modeling experience. Slack, on the other hand, does not require any preprocessing and is natively parallel, which allows for this smooth, consistent real-time preview. We selected a variety of differently sized meshes and subdivided them to different levels. Please note that the performance chart is in log scale. 
We split the timing for OpenSubdiv into two parts. The gray bar shows the total time for the subdivision, including preprocessing, and the green bar is the evaluation of vertex data on the GPU. For lag and slack, the complete subdivision time is shown. We can see that lag already achieves a good speedup, on average 26.6x compared to OpenSubdiv, although it is using the standard SPLA kernels. Slack is then on average an order of magnitude faster than lag, which indicates that our specializations were highly effective. It is interesting to see that the GPU evaluation of OpenSubdiv is in most cases not too much faster than the entire subdivision using Slack. One exception is the Angel model, which is only subdivided to level 1, where Slack cannot unfold its full potential. Concerning the peak memory consumption, Lag needs similar or slightly more memory than OpenSubdiv, due to the explicit storage of all of our matrices. Slack reduces the required memory significantly, as some data, for example F, do not need to be created explicitly, and thus stays significantly below Lag and OpenSubdiv. We think that the sum of all those results makes Slack a well-suited drop-in replacement in modeling tools to provide highly detailed previews of subdivision surfaces without inducing unpleasant idle times after each connectivity changing modeling operation. Our formalisms naturally extend to other subdivision schemes, such as Loop and Square Root 3, where we also outperform the competitors. You can find the details in the paper. We've seen that our approach performs very well when we subdivide topology and vertex data in each iteration. But there are applications, such as rendering of animated meshes, where the connectivity stays the same for many iterations, which is the target use case of OpenSubdiv. In this case, it makes sense to invest more resources in the preprocessing step in order to speed up evaluation of vertex data. As each vertex in the refined mesh is a linear combination of vertices and the control mesh, we can write the vertex data refinement, or evaluation, as a sparse matrix vector multiplication. In our subdivision matrix, rows correspond to refined vertices and columns to control vertices. We built the matrix using only the adjacency information we also generated in the dynamic mesh case. In the first step, we determined the number of non-zero entries in the matrix to create the empty sparsity pattern, which is then filled with weights in the second step. Most of the time, we want to perform multiple iterations of subdivision instead of just a single one. We can simply multiply the individual subdivision matrices to get the single matrix that performs several iterations in one shot. So now that we have a subdivision matrix, we want to use it to perform the evaluation of vertex data. There are many very efficient SPMV implementations for GPUs available, and it is still a very active field of research. One very important aspect when optimizing GPU SPMV is load balancing between threads, as the execution takes as long as the longest running one. This means that the available amount of work needs to be distributed evenly among the available threads. SPMV implementations usually apply some sort of dynamic load balancing that analyzes the matrix at hand and adapts the load balancer accordingly. This of course introduces some overhead for the analysis. The subdivision matrix does not change between consecutive evaluations. Therefore, we can compute the static load balancing in preprocessing which is reused in the evaluations. We use a very simple load balancer that assigns each thread the same number of non-zero values of the matrix. Each thread then accumulates its data locally and combines it with the partial results of other threads. The final result is then written efficiently to global memory. This strategy keeps the overhead low and the load is effectively balanced among the available threads. The evaluation is split into two parts. On the left we can see the preprocessing time. For OpenSubdiv this means refining the topology and computing the subdivision tables on the CPU. Slack computes the adjacency information, refines the topology and assembles the subdivision matrix on the GPU. The GPU preprocessing of Slack is on average more than one order of magnitude faster than OpenSubdiv's CPU preprocessing. But as we consider the mesh connectivity static in this use case, the by far more interesting result is the evaluation of the vertex data on the right. Here, OpenSubdiv uses the pre-computed weights to refine the vertex data while Slack performs its SPMV. While both evaluations are quite similar in their nature, Slack outperforms OpenSubdiv by 1.6x on average, which underlines the efficiency of our SPMV evaluation. The peak memory consumption is quite similar for both approaches, as OpenSubdiv's subdivision tables basically encode the same information as our subdivision matrix. These results indicate that Slack can not just be used in cases where the mesh connectivity changes frequently, but also for subdivision of animated meshes during rendering. This almost concludes my talk today. We introduced a framework to perform subdivision based on a sparse linear algebra abstraction. Everything runs completely on the GPU from topology subdivision to vertex data refinement. Slack can handle different application scenarios. Whether mesh connectivity changes frequently or not at all, Slack provides good performance. 
Our approach is capable of handling extensions such as semi and infinitely sharp creases and also selective subdivision, where only certain parts of the mesh are subdivided, for example around extraordinary vertices. While this talk clearly focused on Cape Clark subdivision, we also have loop and square root 3 in the paper. Of course, the source code is freely available. Thank you very much for joining me today. The QR code contains my contact and a link to the source code, so if you are interested, please feel free to check it out. I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. And um, everybody in the audience, again, keep posting your questions as we speak. Um, let me start with a question. So it seems that in the presentation you were um, dealing with closed meshes without boundary. How about cases where the mesh has a boundary? Is that easily handled or is that a major deal breaker here? No, that's, um, that's absolutely no problem. We have it described in the paper. Um, what we basically do is uh, we have our, um, yeah, the matrix we use to assign um, indices to the edges for edge point computation. And the uh, values actually tell us how many neighboring faces and edges. So we already know which, uh, which vertices or which edges are boundary edges and we can easily fix them. Okay. Um, one question about memory consumption. So I was wondering how much of the memory requirement is actually due to the efficiency driven choice of data structures and how much is really fundamentally inevitable or in other words could i save a lot of memory if speed is not my main concern or is the overhead not actually that significant well um yeah the reported um, peak memory consumption was gpu memory consumption so you can of course so if efficiency is not um your main goal you can save a lot of um, memory by just having some out of core solution basically especially in the single spmb evaluation they are already um yeah i mean already um implementations available for spmv that support that so yeah you could of course so we are keeping, basically, we try to keep as many of the um, structures that um, speed up our, our, our evaluation of vertex data. Um, we try to keep that on the GPU as long as possible and as long as needed. Okay. I see no further questions in the chat. Um, one final one maybe from my side so you showed in your presentation uh, that quite impressively your approach outperforms previous approaches for the various use cases that you uh, considered are there any scenarios for which you would not unconditionally recommend using your methods over others it's a good question. Well, our two main um, optimization goals of our approach was basically the two scenarios where you have um, frequently changing um, to, um, connect mesh connectivity versus really static connectivity. So also for something in between where you have like um, longer uh, runs of static connectivity and then a change and stuff like that, you could also use a combination of our approaches to still have good performance. So. I'm pretty sure you can find one where you don't want to use it, but I can't think of one right now. Okay, thank you very much. And this concludes the session. Thanks to everybody in the audience. And I suggest we virtually thank all the speakers and presenters again. Over and out. <laughs>